Today I come to talk about the body, soul, spirit, or spirit, soul, and body. If you understand this message, disease, poverty, struggle, demonic oppression, see what attack, all of that is history. I promise you it's history. If you understand the message tonight, disease, poverty, problems in marriage, if you fail to get married, every deal you try to do, then go through. What I'm going to share tonight eh, is literally going to fix, it's going to fix your wars. The Bible says, for we know not against flesh and blood, right? The Bible is clear that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty in Christ for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, right? It's all here. It's all here. The imaginations are here. The strongholds are here. Uh, all, everything that exalts itself against our knowledge of Christ is here. And bringing every captivity of thought to Christ. All the thoughts are here. Praise the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 23. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 23. Give me Amplified. I want to read from the Amplified tonight most of the time. The Bible says, And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, separate you from profane things, Make you pure and holy and consecrated to God. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved, sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah. Somebody shout hallelujah. So he said may your body, may your soul, may your spirit or may your spirit, your soul and your body. If you read the order of the spirit, how many of you know that the spirit world has an order? God just does not write. Either it's the law of whichever it is, the laws of the ordinances of God carry a certain order. And that is why some people struggle to interpret biblical truth. Because they are not established primarily in the laws by which truth is interpreted. That is why some people, we have contentions in the body of Christ as of what is true regarding a truth or a scripture and what is not true. Because some people have different understandings. That is why already they tell you the Pentecostal movement alone has more than a thousand denominations. And all of those denominations are different ideas about interpreting the same book. You understand what I'm saying? And that is why God, the primary place of teaching, let me share this before I even go into what I'm supposed to be sharing. The primary place of teaching, the teaching of the Spirit, is to teach you to discern the laws of the Spirit by which truth is interpreted. Did you hear that? That's how the Spirit of Revelation comes upon you. When God teaches you the principles, the primary laws of the Spirit by which you interpret truth, God gives you interpretation before he gives you the revelation of a thing. He gives you the grace of interpretation such that you do not struggle in interpreting what is given. Least you lose out on your season and your time. Are you hearing me? That's why he says the anointing that abides in you, he shall teach you. And the same, the Bible says, shall teach you to abide in him. He teaches you. In him is truth. And the Bible says, and there is no lie. Even as he has taught you, comma, ye shall abide in him. But what is the primary place of the teaching? To teach you to a place where you are learned enough to receive ordinance as a learned man. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So the Bible says that the Lord has given me the tongue of the land. The tongue of the land. To know how to speak a word to him that is weary in season. And to him that is weak. For he wakeneth me morning by morning. The Bible says, and he wakeneth mine ear to hear as learned. Not as a learning man. When God opens your ear to hear as a man who is learned, it means you understand the principle by which the word is given to you to interpret in truth. And that everything that comes, you interpret it by what is already given you, which is the learned spirit. And what is the learned spirit? The spirit that is established in the principles or the laws of the spirit. Somebody say amen. So that is what Isaiah speaks about when he speaks of the tongue of the land. We are not supposed to be learning men. We are supposed to be learned men. Of course, we have Christians who are living a learning kind of experience. But they are living that kind of experience because they, their foundation, the way they began the gospel, it was weak. They were introduced 
in, 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 in places of learning men, not places of learned men. The primary place of scripture and Christianity is for God to teach you the principles of interpreting truth. When you understand those things, everything you read will open up to you. Why? Because there's a principle that backs it up. It's the testimony. Two or three witnesses. Every word is established. Somebody say amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. So even tonight, I want to speak to you not as learning, but as learned people. Not as learning, but as learned people. Now in Thessalonians, he has said that May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and separate you from profane things, make you pure, holy, consecrated to God. And may your spirit, did you see the order again? The land spirit can see this order because it's principle. It's a law in the spirit that everything God writes, he didn't write by mistake. But you see what came first? That your, the Lord may sanctify or preserve you, consecrate you, and may your one spirit and soul and body be preserved, sound, complete, blameless on the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you see how it came? It began from the spirit, it became the soul, and it went into the body. God works with you that way. He speaks to your spirit and then relates with your soul into your body. The body is third in the order of the things of God. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Now, of course, some of you will ask me the question, what is the spirit? What is the soul? What is the body? And I'm going to answer that. In third John chapter 1 verses 2, the Bible says, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things. That means, if there's anything I'm praying for, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. Now, when he's talking about may prosper, he's talking to your spirit. Because you are a spirit. Somebody say, I'm a spirit. With a soul. In a body. Say it again, I'm a spirit. With a soul in a body. Say one more time and say, I am a spirit with a soul in a body. Now, he's telling them spirits. He says, I wish above all things that you, the spirit, may prosper and be in health even as I soul prospers. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. That means God wants your soul perfect. He wants your body perfect. And he wants your spirit perfect. If any of the three has a problem, how do you fix it? Somebody say, Amen. Amen. This is above all things. Of course here, John did not honor the order. But the point still is that this is above all things. That means there are things... You remember one time when I was talking about the truths high and the truths above. How many of you remember that? There are truths of the things high in God and there are truths of things above in God. And this is above. This is above. This is above. I gave an example and I said, if I say I'm going to jump under this roof, the highest I can go in this roof is to where it ends, right? But if I stand beside this roof and I jump above it, it means I can go higher than the roof it is because I'm not under it. You see that? So there are truths that define heights. The truths that define heights are the things you stumble on in the dimension that the Lord has revealed to you. For example, if you're first dimensional, you can only go as high as to the level of where the first dimension is drawn. If you're second dimensional, you can only go as high as where the second dimension ends. But when I'm talking about things above... I'm talking about things that cut across almost all dimensions of the spirit. I'm talking about things that, if you understand it, it throws you into another dimension. It just doesn't leave you in the same dimension. There are things, you see, this is one, but there are many other truths that are bad. There are things that, the moment you stumble on them, you leave the level you're on. You leave it, whether you want it or not. And tonight are such days. Somebody say Amen. Say amen. Now, I want three volunteers here. I want somebody to represent the spirit, to represent the soul. I need somebody who looks like the flesh. Come. Come. Spirit, spirit, come here. Soul, stand here. 
come a bit closer. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to use this. Praise the Lord. As expression or, or, or whatever you want to call it. So this one represents spirit. This one represents soul. And he represents body. Right? Before you were born again, before you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Here, this is the soul. You were a soul. Genesis, the Bible says, And God formed man out of dust, and he breathed into him his nostrils, the breath of life, and that man became a living soul. So in the beginning, when man was formed, you were a soul in a body. The part of you which was spirit was inactive. It was dead. It was inactive. It was dead. Or somebody may say, but in the scriptures, there's a place where they render the spirits of men in the Old Testament dispensation. Yes, that is according to the writers. But if you study scripture, and I'm going to prove that a bit later in a few minutes to come, you will realize that there is no such thing as of God relating with a man who is not yet born again in the spirit. His spirit. And I'm going to prove that in a few minutes. Is that okay? So, originally, before you became born again, or if you're here and you're not born again, you're two in one, right? You are a soul with a body. Soul body, right? In Luganda, Mubiri, right? Meme, Moyo. Isn't it? That's in Luganda, right? So the first man was a living soul. Are you falling to that level? Now, because this man, and, and, and this man was a living soul. Now let me explain the basics of these three so you understand. If you ask me what is the body, the soul, the spirit. The spirit is the part that encounters with the divine. That relates with the divine. It is the part that responds to the divine. It is the thing that expresses itself to the divine. This is the spirit. Okay? The soul is the place of a man that relates with himself. You understand? And the body is the place of a man that relates with the world in which he lives. So this is to the divine, this is to the self, this is to the world. You understand? This one responds to the world by senses. He's a receptive entity, he receives. You understand? He is a processing entity. He can process what is received. He receives from the world through the senses, the five senses, and more, if there are any. You see? So if you touch him, he has received a communication. But I cannot touch the spirit like this. I cannot talk to the spirit with words. The words I'm speaking, this guy understands. Are you following? So he receives. Reception is there. He exchanges with the world. He transacts with the world. This fellow. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? He expresses to the world. If he responds, the body is the expression to the world. Without a body, you're not present to the world. That's why the Bible says, being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You get that point? This fellow, the soul, is the man that points to the self, that gives identity to define you as a human being. The seat of your emotions, your emotional, it's here. Your volition, or the ability to make choice, will, for example, it's here. Your reasoning ability is here. Your logic ability is here. You understand? Your thinking is here. Your joy, happiness all of that is here. It relates with you. It self-awareness, self-actualization, self-conceptualization. 
everything is here. Are you following? Now this guy relates with the things that are unseen. His spirit. He relates with the things that are divine. This one doesn't understand the divine things like this one does. That is why the Bible says in Corinthians that the carnal man cannot receive neither design the things that are of the spirit. He is a man too. Right? Give me the amplified of that. He says, the natural, huh? non-spiritual, are you saying that? It's possible for a man to be non-spiritual. Right? A man who is not born again is what? Non-spiritual. He says, the natural, comma, non-spiritual man does not welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God for they are folly, they are meaningless, they are no sense to him and he is incapable of knowing them progressively, recognizing, understanding and becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually designed, underestimated and appreciated. This guy can understand them but this guy can't. That is why when a man is not born again, he doesn't understand. I remember those days when we phone people who are not born again. You remember those days? And then, oh, no, oh, and no, before we were born again, right? We were not born again, right? Remember the time when you were not born again, those earlier years? And then you find someone who is born again, and they are, shikarabababa, shokotalanda. What are you speaking? You understand? You don't get it. It doesn't make sense. The guy is talking to you, he's like, and you're like, this guy, <laughs> there's something wrong with this guy. You understand? You find the man in the rain, going, you know, yeah, yeah, some mala. And you're like, but why are you screaming? Are you hearing me? The person is screaming like a mad person. Before they were born again, they used to be so humble. But when they became born again, they received the joy of the Spirit, unspeakable, full of glory. Now, they don't understand you. You're always in church. Fellowship, 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 when it's called fellowship. In the overnight fellowship, you're, you're everything. What, what, do you even have a personal life anymore? No. Back in those days, you used to go in the movies, go have lunch with your boys, drink, get high. You understand? Now they don't see you in the bars anymore. You're strange. Then they ask you, how come you don't? <laughs> they tell him, I found something. Do I have a witness in the house? Now when you tell a man who has drunk alcohol for many years and you tell him there is something that satisfies more than bell or tasker, he's like, what, what, what are you talking about? But it is there. Somebody said it is there. Do I have a witness in the house? So you have these three. Now, before you were born again, you were a, a non-spiritual, a soul, and you used to live in a body. Your redemption was not in you as a soul. Leviticus 17. I'll show you some verses 11. Give me the amplified again. He says, For the life, the animal soul, right, is in the blood. Are you hearing me? The life, the animal soul, is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life which it represents. You understand? The life makes atonement for the soul. But the life is in the blood and the blood is in the body. Do you get that? Or give the KJV if it makes sense there. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the animal soul... The Amplified called it. Is in the blood. The life of the flesh, the KJV says, is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. I have given the life of the flesh which is in the blood for the atonement of your soul. That means that the soul was atoned. It was saved by the flesh. What a man did in the flesh saved the soul. There was nothing a man could do in the soul to save the flesh because the soul does not have the ability to serve the flesh, neither serve the spirit. He is the middle guy who can go anywhere on whoever can pull him. Because the soul looks to the flesh for redemption. Did you get that? Yes. Romans 8, 6 says, Romans 8, 6, give me amplified again. 
Romans chapter 8 verse 6. It says, Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason, without the Holy Spirit, is death. Are you hearing me? Death that comprises of all miseries arising from sin, both here and thereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul and peace, both now and forever. Now he has introduced something new here. He's saying there was in the Old Testament, the Old Testament this message, or oh, in the life before you received Jesus Christ, the dead spirit, you the living soul then, you are, retru- you are saved by the flesh. But the challenge is that with the flesh, no man can be justified through the flesh. That means that the soul was looking to something that could not save it. Are you following me, somebody? But anyway, man looked into it for saving. Even though it could not save him, it was the only hope to save him. That is why every man who was living the life before, he was susceptible to death. It was inevitable for him to die because he relied on something that could die and could kill. Are you following me? Now, he has brought, but he says, but there is a mind of the Holy Spirit. And that is life and soul peace, both now and forever. In other words, when you became born again and you became a spirit, the soul now looks to life. Are you following me? Now, your soul then used to look to the flesh, the consequence of which was death. Now, because you are born again, your soul can look to the spirit which is life and peace but because it is the place of volition the place of will the place of choice this soul can choose to go anywhere he wants at any one time you see what i'm saying when you became born again you chose you accepted jesus as your lord and savior and you became born again that means you received the life of the spirit that one was sealed eternally. Salvation is sealed eternally. Somebody say amen. amen. That is the one thing that is a guarantee before God. That when your soul made the choice to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That was sealed forever. From that day, your soul agrees with the Spirit. But now another principle comes in play. Tell somebody another principle comes in play. After you became born again, you received the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil started to attack you. He knows he cannot take you out of the life of salvation because salvation is eternal. You understand? He knows he cannot take you out of Jesus Christ because your salvation is eternal. It was not an earthly indulgence. It was a heavenly plan. It was bigger than the ability of the soul to comprehend. Are you hearing? Now, every attack you have in your life, right? Regardless of where it starts from, eh? it seeks to get the attention of this fellow. Okay? It seeks to get the attention of this fellow. The devil cannot take you out of salvation. But he can make salvation complicated for you. He can make salvation a struggle for you. He can make salvation a survival experience for you. Not a victorious life in Christ. He can make salvation hard. He can make everything hard. That's what the devil can do. He can complicate things for you. But also it's possible to live a very glorious life in Jesus. It's very possible. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, the Bible says in Corinthians, I think 15, that, let's open there, 45. It says, the first man Adam was a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You are two in one. You know that? This guy here is like the second Adam. This man here is like the first Adam, which was a living soul. soul. Are you hearing me? Now, let me just give an example. You wake up and your head starts to pound. Poo, 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 poo. Where is that transaction? In the body. 
The body is feeling headache, right? When your body feels headache, immediately you, you receive the sign of headache. Your reaction, your immediate reaction, your immediate reaction defines the state of your soul and your spirit. You understand what I'm saying? It defines the state of your soul and your spirit. Now, because we live in a principled world, a, a world of laws, like faith is a law. You know that. The scriptures are very clear. We boast by the law of faith. Right? There is a law that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word in the earth is what? Established. Somebody say amen. Second Corinthians 13 verse 1. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth, listen, of two or three witnesses shall every word be? That means in every situation where there are two or three witnesses, a word can be established. A contract can be established. A, a, a transaction can be done. That is why when you're buying something, they said we need a witness. The person who is selling, the person who is buying, and the third person. This is now... Probably the person who is selling is not the witness, but the person buying and the person who is witnessing the transaction is the third or the second witness. Or probably three, four, five. But without two. And that's why the scripture keeps on doing that. Even in the gospels, Jesus told them, is it not written in your law that at the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word is established. The scriptures let us speak. He says, I think it's in Timothy. Do not bring up an issue against an elder, save by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That principle always works in everything. Get two, three witnesses, you can establish a word. For you, you hear a rumor. One rumor about someone, and you already run. Yeah, I heard, I heard that one. He eats spiders. You know, I so say like, how many witnesses have you heard it from? I'm not talking about the one witness who told 17 witnesses, and all of these 17 people have one witness. The 17 are, are gossipers and rumor mongers, right? There was only one who claims to be the witness. Where is the second witness? Where is the third witness? You see? So the Bible is clear that the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word is established. The Amplified Bible, again, of the same verse says, uh, it says, by the testimony of two or three witnesses, must any charge, every accusation, statement be sustained and confirmed. That means the moment you have two, you're confirming, right? Are we agreeable on that? Now here is the challenge. The flesh feels headache. The soul, the emotions, your feelings, your reasoning, and everything, it's here. That's why you feel a headache, right? Now, if your soul conceives it and reasons that this is a headache and owns it, it goes on the side of the flesh. Now you have a headache. Before, it was your flesh with a headache. You see that? Before it was your flesh. Now your soul and body both have a headache. That is why you hear somebody saying, I'm feeling headache. Wait, who are you? This, this is Abe, right? This is his head. If his head gets a pain, it is his head paining. It is not him. You get it? Because the him can only be defined either by the soul or the spirit. If he's mature, by the spirit. If he's a soul and spirit. If he's a baby, body. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, his body has a what? Headache. Now, when his body gets a headache, the emotion, the emotional responses, your confession, you're thinking, oh my God, what is happening to me? I think I'm getting a headache. I have a headache. I have this pounding headache. The, the soul has allowed at the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word is established. Now, according to the world you don't see, it is an established, confirmed truth that he has a headache. Now, this is the spirit man. He's left alone. 
Because he is an enmity to the flesh. The spirit is an enemy to the flesh. But the scripture didn't say that soul is an enemy to the flesh. Neither an enemy to the spirit. Neither soul friend to the flesh. Or friend to the spirit. He can go anywhere. You understand? So he has a headache. Flesh has a headache. Soul starts to become emotional about it. You know what people who have headaches start to do? Panadol. They start getting water. They start covering themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Then the person covers themselves in a jacket. Hey, oh, hey, oh. You, you understand what I'm saying? The soul has what? Now, there's not much. It can only take grace for that headache to live. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, because he received in the senses, your daughter is dead. Who received it? Is it the spirit? Is it the soul? Through the sense, right? If he was deaf and I spoke to him and I told him, your daughter is dead, he'll be like, I love you. I love you. Because that day makes sense, you see? But they've told him, your daughter, whichever way, either the eye, you know, he has read, they wrote it on a text message, but all of that was received by the senses, which is in the flesh. You understand? He is receptive. He's reactionary and he's expressive. This is the body. Three things. Reception, reaction, expression. Here, right? The moment they tell him your daughter is dead, huh? the emotions come through. My daughter. My woo! But then this one starts to I refuse. My child is not dead. My child is not dead. My child is not dead. This one is This one is You understand? This one is even dead. I don't even understand what to do. You understand? And let me tell you what they call feigned faith. The faith that deceives to self. You remember the end of the commandment? The end of commandment speaks of love what? Love what? Out of a pure heart and of faith and faith. From which some have swapped off. Now the Bible says they indulge themselves in vain junglings. They speak vainly. They are in the name of Jesus. This is going to happen. I am healed. I am a, I'm more than a conqueror. I am this. But nothing is happening in their lives. But they are good at confession. But if you check inside them, their soul is agreeing with everything in the flesh. But their spirit speaks right. Are you hearing me? He says, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith and faith. The faith does not, does not lie to the self. Faith, faint, is the faith that lies to the self. How? You're here saying, I believe I'm healed. Yet your soul and body agree that you're sick. Oh, I'm rich. Yet your soul and body, why? You, 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 you. Your emotions show that you're a poor man, but your mouth speaks like a rich man. Your thinking is of a poor man, but your spirit is speaking like a rich man. Your reasoning is of a poor man, but your confession is, I'm rich, I'm blessed, for I know of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, for who was rich, but made himself poor for me, that he, through his poverty, I might become rich. Hallelujah, I'm rich. But when we check your mind, you have a poverty mentality. You sit on your bed at night and imagine, oh, where will I get drenched? How will I drive? Oh, what? You're thinking silly things, but when you're in Fanero, hallelujah, I think so. Then you tell somebody, you're blessed. But then they even stand up. Mm, mm, mm. That's me. They're even giving somebody a high five. That's what we shared during lunch. He's sharing exactly what we shared during lunch. Yes. But when we check your soul. Can I go a bit deeper on money? Can I go a bit deeper? Poverty. Listen. Poverty is a spirit. Are you hearing me? And a man who has a spirit of poverty does not need to be poor.
Lack is one. Lack, lacking money or finances is just one of the signs of the spirit of poverty. That is one of them. It is not the whole entirety representing the spirit of poverty. Let me give you a few. I don't care how rich you are. If it's not in you to pay people who you owe, I don't care how much money you have. You have a spirit of poverty. Why? Because everything that leaves you arises a consciousness in your spirit that you're becoming poor. Yet the very reason why you borrowed, you still had a consciousness that you were poor. I don't care how rich you are. If you have somebody's money, pay it. I don't care how poor you think you are. If you have somebody's money, the Bible says, Oh, no man except to love. Don't keep debts with people. I don't care how rich you are. And there are people who want to pay, but they don't have. But there are people who have the ability to pay, but they don't want to pay. That's the spirit of poverty. Can I give you another one? The scripture says that there is that which holdeth more than is met. There is that which holdeth, withholdeth more than is meet. In other words, God is not saying you shouldn't save. But there are people who over save. They withhold more than is meet. Now, some of you think, no, you should save. Have a savings account. Save some money. But don't save to an extent where you can't eat food because you're saving. <laughs> that is a poverty spirit. I am rich. I am rich. <laughs> Tell somebody to wear Rumia. Yes. If you have 10,000, go to a nice place and eat a nice meal. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. But there are people who live all their lives poor and die rich. (laughs) Do you know those people? Now for them all their lives you thought they didn't have what? The day they die. (laughs) This guy has money. No, Tewerum, your darling, if you have it. Yeah. Buy yourself a nice shoe, go to a nice restaurant, enter a nice saloon, for all things are yours and you are Christ. And Christ is the Lord, for he shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What if I don't have fuel? He shall supply all your needs. You know how parents sometimes sit down their children. You know, you have to go to school like a poor child. No, 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 no. You're not supposed to go to school like a poor child. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no, no. That's the spirit. Poverty. That's the spirit of poverty. That's the spirit of what? Poverty. Oh, me, I can't spend that for this. What do you mean you can't spend that for that? I mean, I can't spend that one. How can I spend this? No, I spend it. It's much for. Listen. Who was it made for? Muhammad bin Said al Maktoum? I don't know whether I'm communicating to somebody. That's a poverty spirit. That's a poverty spirit. Can I give you another sign? People who don't tithe or give their first fruits, you're poor because that tends to you is hope. I don't care how rich you, if you don't tithe, you're a poor man. Why? Because your hope, your hope is not in the Lord. It's in the tenth you keep. 
The tenth you keep. It's in that first fruit you keep. It's in that offering you keep. Even your giving. For me, even when I have money, I arrange my money from small notes to big. Deliberately. I don't I don't get ten thousand I don't get fifty K, then I put on twenty and then ten and then five. Then I no. I get I get five, ten, twenty, then I put like a fifty K on top. Why? Because when I'm sowing, I want to sow big. I always arrange my money from, even if I'm, I have dollars in my pocket, hundred dollars comes on top, then the fifties, then the twenties, then the ones. Such that when I want to sow, the easiest one is a hundred. This guy is boasting. No, I'm just rich. If you think like that, you are poor. <laughs> Why? Because I always believe I should always give big. That's all. I should give more than I have, than I keep. That's just me. That's just me. I told, let me tell you. Me now when I look at myself, I have gone way beyond tithe that it can scare you how much I give God every month. It can scare some of you out of your skin. Tithe is a very small thing for me, Apostle Grace Rebecca. Apostle. I no longer tithe. And I started slowly from 10 to 20, to 30, to 40, to 50, to 6, and I'm still going. And I have my reasons. Apostle. It's my faith. Can you watch me? Watch me! Let me tell you. Watch me. If you are saying, I, I doubt you, if you doubt, use me as an example, you'll see what I'm talking about. You know why I do that. I'm not poor. I'm trying to tell, even why I arrange my money that way, eh? I'm trying to put this soul in a certain angle. Do you understand what I'm saying? I give with joy. So if you're not tithing, Bambi, drive your car, Max, do everything you want, you're poor. That little girl who gets 10,000 from her father for a week, and gets 1,000 shillings. Let me tell you. Have you ever noticed? You notice this. Notice this. If you have known me for 5 years, 6 years, 10 years. Have I spoken for 30 minutes for you to take an offer? Have I even talked about an offering? Because I'm not poor. You know there are some people, hey, if you don't get your money, please, God will help you. He, he, give all you have. If you don't have, okay, remove even that one which is in your shoe. God loves you. Please, give. give. If you don't give, the, the ministry will not move. Please. Get a hold of your offering. Okay, let me open for your Bible and I show you why you should give. The Bible says that if you give your tithe, he shall rebuke the devourer. For your own sake, give. give. Then after 45 minutes. I'm going to make a special prayer. Those of you who are, want to partner, bring one. Now, put up your hands right there. I, for you, I'm bring a special prayer. Why? Because you. Listen. Our partners last year doubled. They're giving again last year doubled. I said, now money, what's up? Even this year I am certain to quadruple, I don't know, but it has to go higher. Why? Because we are not poor. So some people don't understand why we don't put too much pressure. Sometimes I can pray for your offering, even if I don't pray for it. This is fertile ground. You just throw. This is fertile. No. If you want a word for a witness, if your finances have increased since you came to Fanero, put up your hand. Ah, see. You see all those hands. Fertile? You understand what I'm saying? So there's a reason why even me, I can't take 30 minutes to explain. You see, no, we teach about giving, but at the right opportunity. But by the time I have to preach to you now, if you have one million, come, ah, uh -huh, stay with your poverty spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Now, poverty mentality. I am rich. I am this. I, I can't be broke. I, but you're not tasty. I can't be broke. But you, you're, you're not paying people. 
I can't be broke. But your miser, your miser on everything. Everything you, everything, you understand? Everything is, every thing, you understand? Responsibility. Shows whether you have poor spirit or not. Men. Men. Pepsis. Put food on the table. If you don't have a job, she will understand. things of sitting back when women are working like donkeys no 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 that is the poverty mentality Abakazi munyambe munyambe every man must be responsible of their own household your wife must be might be earning seven million shillings and you're earning two million that's okay pay fees anyway oh but darling i have more years that's for you love on yourself i'm the man of my house and i have to take responsibility of my own household thank you if she considers the field and buys it wonderful let her buy her field but that's her field Listen, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, go to all the seven emirates, go to all those Muslim nations, look at their divorce rates, they are 0.000001, why? Men are working, men are working, partly the divorce issues we are having in, 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 in the body of Christ today, now women are doing men's jobs. So she has no time to be creative. Marry her, tell her if you're doing your career, do it for passion. But for money, I'm the man. I'm the man. Are you hearing me? Don't be intimidated. Even if your wife earns 200 million and you earn a million, be a man. Are you hearing me? Don't be intimidated. I earn a million shillings, but I do my part and you know it. Respect me. Respect me. Hard worker. Go to Somalis and see. Their women are home raising children. That's why divorce rates are few. HIV is low in those guys because they are raising their children. Our Christian women, all of them are working. I'm not saying it's a problem, but work to a certain level and go back home. Do what the Lord called you to do. Fend for your children. Raise up your child in the way of the Lord. They need... Come on! Abasadia to call you. Tell your neighbor, let us work hard. It's enough when they start mopping at home and cleaning and washing utensils. All of that is work. Are you hearing me? Cleaning under the bed, cleaning the carpet, washing the bed sheets, the towels, everything. Making breakfast and dinner. And then she works from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Then she comes home. She has prepared dinner. For you, why just watching television? Pay her. <laughs> oh no, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a career if you're a woman. Pursue it for passion's sake. And your husband will support you. You understand what I'm saying? But when the time comes and you have to wear between career and children, choose your children. I know this is not, what I'm speaking is not popular. But it doesn't make sense for you to be a chief executive officer of a wonderful company and your kid is dying on crack and drugs. Because you are working hard. Where are the options? Stay home, let me work. In the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. If you're doing a career, do it. It's okay. But only to a time when you're able. You might get to a point and you're not able. You're not able. You might. You might. You might. It's possible. And this might not work for everyone. Some of you are single mothers. You have no choice. Don't worry. The Lord will open a door for you. 
to give you time for your children. And he will make that door for you. Because you are a woman. Somebody say amen. Because you are a what? A woman. He will make a way. Is somebody learning something? Now. Anything can happen. And the flesh can receive anything. But the moment your soul agrees. Oh. We have found that you are stage 4 cancer. <laughs> My children come. You understand what I'm saying? You start writing your will. You start explaining why you even kept the last titles of land which you've never told anyone. Everything comes out. I have a confession to make. You go make peace with everyone in your heart. You understand? This is the soul. And the spirit man starts to say, the, the spirit man in you starts to pick all the wrong lines of scripture. You know the Bible says that I'm torn betwixt <laughs> to be in the body for your sake or to go and to be with the Lord which is far better. It is okay to go home. Then your spirit also agrees. Then cancer kills you. Are you hearing me? James chapter 1, verses 21. Give me amplified. He says, Get rid of all uncleanliness and rampant outgrowth of wickedness. Are you hearing me? And in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your soul. What saves your soul? What saves your soul? But not just the word, the implanted, the one which has entered your heart. Not the mind which is in your mind. Not the word which is in your emotion. But which is in your spirit. Are you hearing me? And the next verse says, Be doers. You see that? That's the re result. That's the consequence. When a man puts the word in his heart, he becomes a doer. He becomes a doer, not merely listeners of it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to truth. Where is the reasoning again? Here. Do it. Be a doer if you want to save your soul. If you want to know that a word is planted in a man, you see his reaction in crisis. That's how you know that the word of God is written in a man's spirit. You see his reaction in what? In crisis. There are three things that happen. And in Matthew 11, verses 28. There are three things. You come to him. Are you hearing me? You come to the Lord. When, when, when you are in the soul and you need to walk in the spirit. The right man as appointed by God. You come to him, right? And he causes you to rest. And he refreshes your soul. And the next verse says, You take of his yoke and then learn of him. Are you hearing me? He says, Take of my yoke and learn of me, for I'm gentle, meek, and humble. And you will find rest. Listen, relief, ease, refreshment, recreation, blessed quiet for your soul. How? You come. To him you take of his portion, his yoke, and learn of him. Two or three things that take place. When they take place, your actions, everything you start to do resonates with truth. Because you came to him, you took of his yoke. That means you, you, you underwent his thought life. You, 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 you configured your brain to the way he thinks. And then you learned of him. And then you started to do things like he has taught you to do them. Because he thinks a certain way. You know, it's one thing to do something you've learned, but without the mind of it. The yoke here is the mind of it. You carry the mind of what you do in line with truth. Now, let's go back to James. James said, be doers of the word, obey the message, and not merely listeners of it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. All right? But if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it, and being a doer of it, he's like a man who looks himself at his own natural face in a mirror. And the Bible says, for he thoroughly or thoughtfully observes himself and then goes out and promptly forgets what he was like. 
That's how you are. That means you don't know who you are. You understand what I'm saying? You, you learn to walk into the power of the word. You learn, you see, that's what it says in Corinthians. That the first man, he was, he was a life-giving, and then the first Adam was a, a living soul, and the second Adam was, a, was made a quickening spirit. Give me the amplified of that. He says, it is written that the first man Adam became a living being, individual personality, and the last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, restoring death to life. And the next verse says, but it is not the spiritual life which came first, but the physical and then the spiritual. Right? And the next verse says, the first man was from out of the earth, made of dust, earthly minded. Way before you were born again, your mind was earthly. You thought like a man of the earth. You're going to love this. The second man is the Lord out of heaven. That means that when you become born again, you bore the mind. That's the yoke of Christ. It is light. It gives relief to your spirit and your soul. Why? Because you, you have learned of how he responds to things. Next verse says, Now those who are made of the dust are like him who was first made of the dust. Earthly minded. And as is the man from heaven, also are those who are of heaven. Heavenly minded. And just as we have born the image, I love the way the Amplified say this. Just as we've born the image of the man of the dust, so shall we, and so let us also, so shall we, and let us also, that is now, future now. KJV only puts future. But the Amplified says, so shall we, and also now, let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. Somebody say, I'm a man of heaven. Oh, somebody say, I'm a man of heaven. That is why when Paul saw this, the mystery opened. He said, we shall not all sleep. We shall all be caught up. He saw the, the, the trumpet sounding. And the dead in the Lord are rising up. The, 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 he went to the end of things. When he said to see the mystery. Because he, he was a man of heaven. Let me show you as I conclude. Mm. Headache. Cancer. The doctors told you just a few minutes ago. You're suffering from a worst case of this disease. And it's incurable. Because you have planted the word of God. The word is spirit. And it is life. Are you hearing me? The first response emotionally. Are you going to fear? Because if you're fearing, that's a second witness to the flesh. If you cry, that's a second witness to the flesh. If you start complaining, that's a second witness to the flesh. If you start writing your will, that's a second witness to the flesh. You get silent and get in the corner and start weeping, that's a second witness to the flesh. And many of you have asked yourselves, why is it that some people believe and confess right? But they die later. Simple. Their souls were not agreeing with the spirit. Their souls were agreeing with the flesh. But their spirit was speaking deception. Because it wasn't speaking as the soul agreed. You, you, can, you can cram all the phrases, the phrases in the scripture. I'm this. I'm above. I'm not beneath. I'm more than a conqueror. But Christ is trying to say, I can't die. I refuse. You speak all you want. But until your emotions get into it, until your reasoning gets into it, until your thinking gets into it, until your mind gets into it, until your heart gets into it, until your worship, your praise, your, yeah, your actions. Does a man of cancer go to bed? Yes. But a man without cancer, do you stay in bed? You wake up in the morning. You button your shut up. When they say you have stage 4 cancer, you put on your shoes and go to work. And then they ask you, what did the doctor say? They said, I am perfect. That's called a man of heaven. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? The doctor tells you you have this disease, it's going to kill you. You tell the doctor, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You laugh at the situation, the doctor, his stories, their papers, the machines... Then you walk out of that hospital smiling like nothing happened. Then they ask you what happened. You tell them nothing. And here is the mistake. After all of those confessions, you sit in a corner and start thinking, now if I die from here. You haven't gotten it. You can't die 
That's the secret. You can't die. That is the thing the devil has lied. That are the deceptions that you've put in your spirit. Listen, you cannot die if you stick to the word. Let God be true and every man a liar. You are a believer. You can't die in faith. You cannot. That's contrary. He says the just shall live by faith. Faith doesn't kill. It gives life. Tell somebody faith doesn't kill. It gives life. Turn to the other one too and tell them faith doesn't kill. Tell somebody I'm not going to die in my movie. I'm the superstar. I began it and I'm going to finish it because I know who began it in me. So it is God who works in me both to will and to do. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. He directed my movie and he told me I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to make you prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. That expected end. I shall not die. The moment your emotions agree, the soul goes this side. And then the flesh is like... You remember in Corinthians, when Paul says, we shall not all sleep. Eh? He began from the natural, the man from heaven. And he says, oh, behold a mystery. We shall not all sleep. He speaks of the, the trumpet sounding and everything. And then before the end of Corinthians, he starts to say, oh, death, where is thy instinct? He can't see death anymore. He, even if he looks, he, he can't see death anymore. Why? Because he has been swallowed up. Oh, oh. He has been swallowed up. He has been swallowed up by life. He has, when he saw it, he, he realized he can't die. In the same chapter, he says, Death, where is thine sting? Oh, grave, where is thine victory? I don't think I'm going to die. I don't think my business is going to die. I don't think my marriage is going to die. I don't think my children are going to die. I don't think my mind is going to die. I don't think my career is going to die. I don't think that my womb can die. I don't think that my business can die. I don't think that my ministry can die. Because I'm a man of heaven. I'm a man of heaven. The soul agrees. And in heaven, the angels get the stamp. On the date, and then they put the date, you agreed. Then they stamp, confirm the life. Bah! I don't care what your body does after that. Let it fly. Let it do whatever it wants. He says, if you live by the flesh, you will surely die. Romans 8. He says, but if you buy the spirit. (laughs) He says, if by the spirit, modify the deeds of the body, you shall diabetes. What is diabetes? Who is diabetes? How can diabetes kill me? I cannot die diabetes. Hypertension cannot kill me. You stir up holy emotions in your spirit. You start laughing before anybody tickles you. Are you hearing me? You start encouraging yourself before anybody speaks a thing. You say, I will not die. I will not fail. I cannot faint. David told his soul, Why art thou cast on my soul? Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. You talk to your soul. You refuse to be sad. Some of you have gone through things that don't have definition. They're enough to make a man run mad. But you're still here and you're sober. You're still serving and surviving. The Lord has kept you. What has been inside your spirit has kept you this far. Believe me, it shall preserve you to the end. There is no death in your story. Nothing of yours will die. And I decree it upon your life in the name of Jesus. Whatever in your life was intending to die, had a testimony or a line of, of death or destruction, 
I want to speak upon the sound of my voice. By reason of the anointing of the word that has been spoken tonight. Everything that had died in your life will leave. It will leave. You are a man of heaven. You are not subject to the elements of the earth. You are not subject to the elements of Uganda. You are not subject to the systems of Africa. You are not subject to the political systems of East Africa. You are not a subject to the social systems of Africa. You are not subject to the financial systems of Africa. No. You are a man of heaven. You will live and not die to proclaim the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Stir up your soul. Stir up your soul. Somebody get to your feet. Talk to it right now by your spirit. Tell it come back from Hades. Come back from Sheol. Come back from confusion. Come back from, 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 from madness. Come back from fear. Come back from the opinions of doctors. Come back from the opinions of men. Come back from the rudiments of this earth. Come back from the elements of deception. Talk to your soul. To your soul. If you are given a a death sentence on your life by a doctor, tonight I change it in the name of Jesus. If you are given an opinion by a family member, a relative of a friend that you're going to fail. I have good news for your soul. He knows the plans that he has for you. Plans to make you prosper. And not to harm you. To give you that future. That hope. That expected end. I shall leave. Somebody speak in tongues. There is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power. In the name of Jesus, that breaks every chain. There is an anointing delivering people here. There is an army.
minutes pushing. I feel somebody is pushing out something. I feel somebody is giving back to something. I, I want to give you a few more 60 seconds. Push it out, whatever it is, whatever it is. Let it come out. with your spirit because the sweet of the soul is joy and the Bible says with joy you shall draw from the wells of salvation you know a few minutes ago just a few seconds ago joy came in my spirit like somebody has touched an answer oh somebody has got something take it in the name of Jesus oh come on somebody stir yourself in joy when joy hits your spirit on a revelation understand that your soul agrees with the spirit imagine a man they tell that you have cancer and then he says oh satalaba I can't <laughs> laugh at the devil You will leave. Tell somebody I plan to live long. And I plan to be a success while I live. Tell them I'm going to enjoy my way of salvation. I am going to enjoy it. Persecution may come, but I'll be happy. Tell them I'll be happy. And I will win. In the end, I will win. In the name of Jesus. 